Welcome to the Breakfast Leadership Show, where we interview global thought leaders on business, leadership, and life. Here's your host, keynote speaker, best-selling author, and chief burnout officer of the Breakfast Leadership Network, Michael Levitt. Welcome back. I've got fellow podcaster Doug Utberg on the line. Doug, how are you? Doing good. Great. So, appreciate being on the show, Michael. Yeah, really looking forward to this conversation. It's uh, your backstory is really good. You know, obviously your show and things like that, and you know the values that you have around people first and all that. So, for those that aren't familiar with you, I want you to share a little bit about you, and then we'll dive into the conversation. Sure thing. So my podcast is called People First Leaders, peoplefirstleaders.net. And the idea is it's interviews with founders, CEOs, and CFOs who put people and customer value first, which sounds kind of like, kind of like, you know, all right, well, Captain Obvious, yeah, well, isn't that what everybody does? And it's like, no, actually it isn't. It's what everybody says they do, but there's not that many people who like actually do it. By, by actually do it, what I really mean is, they make the hard decisions that involve a personal sacrifice. Uh, as because, like, one of the things I'm fond of saying, you know, I have a lot of little one liners, but one of the things I'm fond of saying is that as soon as your business becomes about the money, and this usually doesn't happen consciously, but once you make the it's about the money decision, you are on a slow road to becoming a psychopath because then you will say, okay, well, all right, uh, we didn't hit earnings. We need to lay some people off. Well, how are we going to decide how to, who to lay off? Uh, okay, just get rid of that department. Uh, or you know, you you end up doing things to try to optimize the amount of money you're making. Which I'm not saying that money is bad; profits are good, but they should be created as an exchange of value. You shouldn't be chasing the profit first. You should be creating value first and generating a profit from that value, not trying to find any way that you can skim a buck off the top of someone else's work. Yeah, and creating value is what's going to help you navigate through challenging times yeah. and make you memorable. And yes where people will be loyal because say, yeah, I get great value out of this uh, establishment, this business, mm-hmm. this vendor, you know, yeah. it, or these employees, you know, it, it's, you know, taking care of your people. And, you know, I know your story about, you know, you know, working in, in the field and, mm-hmm. and getting, you know, that, uh, really brief layoff <laughs> I mean, and, and and it's like and i'm not saying brief as in oh he was just laid off for a period of time no the actual uh you know putting all that time in yeah. in the organization and it was like you know you know they, they were operating on the 24 second time clock okay let's see yeah. if we can get them out here you know before yeah. the buzzer rings you know or somebody hit the exactly. ramp you know it's like and it it's such a cold heartless and i you know i speak at hr conferences i work in HR, I advise HR organizations, HR consultant, all that stuff. It's like you have to please make it human. Don't like okay, yeah. you got five seconds, get them out the door. And you know, the last uh, organization that I ran was healthcare organization. And one of the things that we did, and actually, I had a boss that mm-hmm. uh, did it to you know, did it to me this way yeah. um, was. They they say okay I'm gonna get some difficult news to share um, effective immediately your role is ending at the organization this is Willis or this is yes. Barbara and they're gonna sit down with you and they're gonna you know talk about some things and you basically remove yourself from the situation you use an mm-hmm. outside party that is comforting you know, speaks in nice tones and, you know, says, okay, this is very overwhelming. Here's some information. You don't need to look at it right now. It's like, I, this is, you know, are, are you okay to drive home? You know, they're, they're literally, yeah. you know, concierge type of thing yeah. to take care of the person, to ease, ease that shock. And, yeah. um, and when, because that happened to me, when I had to, using a Jack Welch term, dehire some people, I use that as well yeah. because it's it's the best way to do it. It's not that, you know, okay, it's like 90 seconds, that's a new record. Yeah. Okay, next. <laughs> you know, it, it's so it's such a cold thing. And by doing it the other way, mm-hmm. it just it it adds a human element to it. Yeah. Um, it's still 
sucks. Don't, don't get me yeah, wrong. Right. It, and I've been again on both sides of it. And I used to say, no, nah, letting people go is harder than that, which I, it just sucks all the way around. Yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate, but it, it happens, but you can, there's better ways to do it. Yeah. Now there is one silver lining that I will uh, put in, put behind being let go in a cold and heartless manner. And that is that once you've gone through it, you're really not afraid of it anymore. And seriously, what worse is there? <laughs> okay, you know, you you figure, all right, I've already had this the 30 minute uh you know, the 30 minute meeting with no subject come on my calendar and just you know person pops up, all right, well, we're eliminating your position, network access is cut off and you're gone. So once you've gone through that and made it, you can be like, all right, well, what am I worried about? <laughs> and I think it, in a way, that can almost kind of it can either crush you, which it did for a little while, or it can kind of spur you to be fearless, which it did eventually. Yeah, for me, it was similar. I had a, it was like, it was 15 minutes, you know, it, was yeah. like, it, it wasn't there and there was nothing on there. And uh -huh. me going, you know, emailed the boss, like um, anything I can bring to prepare. And she didn't respond. And I could sense I'm like, okay, <laughs> spidey senses were yeah. tingling. And oh, d the day of this recording, um, yeah. it, we're right around the time that John Romita Sr., the mm -hmm. artist that you know, drew Spider Man, passed away yeah. in 93. So shout out to the Romita family, you know, right. that they listened to my show, but it just I said spidey <laughs> senses and it came up. I saw that this morning. But anyway, um, because I saw that, my spidey senses are going, yeah, I think I'm going to get let go because there was some, some yeah. challenges with some team members that were i'll say this because it's been long enough I, favorites okay yeah. and they were upset in how i was approaching a situation and they didn't agree with it and became a, a squeaky wheel and they just decided to you know cut bait so uh, i knew that and i'm like well you know what I, I learned my lesson a long time ago don't bring your entire house to your workplace because when you got to pack it up, then yeah. you got a lot of things to lug. And, you know, you're walking down the sidewalk with the banker's boxes. Everybody mm -hmm. knows what happened. And it's, it's, it's like, yeah. no, just pack, pack light. Um, so when it happened, I was like, I literally, I had an umbrella and I think I had my coffee. So I grabbed that. I think I left a breakfast sandwich half eaten on my desk. I'm like, oh, they'll clean it up hopefully eventually. Uh, but you know, I just you know left, and but that wasn't the first time I'd ever been let go. Yeah. So I was I was more like, oh okay, I was kind of laughing about it a little bit. Um, yeah. Then then the reality kind of hit, and I was like, ooh okay, now what? And you know, again, it's just one of those things where you know it, when it happens, you go all right. You know, you just move on from it. Great. Okay. Frees me up to do other things. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, and because I think that that gets into another thing that uh, I keep thinking about as well is that, you know, you think, okay, well, why are we so attached to this job in the first place? Go, okay, well, we have bills to pay. Okay. Well, why do we have bills to pay? Usually it's because we start leveraging up this lifestyle that in a lot of cases, or is really more to impress other people than to really create things that we really value for ourselves. Now, you know, with that said, you know, I still live in the, I still live in the house. It's way bigger than what, <laughs> you know, than, than what we need and, 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 but this is one of the things that I kept thinking about as well as I'm like, okay, well, you know, like we're terrified, right? You know, we have a house, we have private school, we have cost mortgage, all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, how am I going to pay for all this? And I'm like, but you know, and A, we figured it out. But B, even if we didn't, go, okay, well, so you have to sell your help, sell your help, sell, sell your house. So what? You know, so, you know, maybe you have to figure out a different way for your kids to go to school. All right. So what? Um, you know, it's, <laughs> that, 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 that most of the things we're afraid of are not world ending. They're speed bumps. And you know you treat them like speed bumps, and then you don't have to be afraid of them. And I think that's that. That to me is the big aha: is that you know I, I don't want to get into full nihilism and say nothing means anything, but just about everything that we worry about means a whole lot less than we think it does. Like the analogy, will this matter in five years? And if you say no, then it's like okay, yeah. don't don't waste all of your energy now worrying about it. You're gonna you, you'll you'll take care of it. You'll figure it out. Yeah, you lose jobs, you get new jobs. You, you yeah. know, if you run into financial difficulties and you know you lose 
you know, the repo man comes knocking. Okay. Well then you'll, you'll get back and you'll get whatever yeah. was, you know, repossessed and, you know, it, and don't, and I always tell people, don't be mad at them. You had an agreement. Yes. Right. There were situations that came into play that you couldn't make the payments. So part of that agreement is if you don't pay, then they yeah. reserve the right to take it back. It's, it's a business transaction. That's you know, it's, you know, it's the, when you get better and give their property of, back willingly, you know, just, of means, course. you know, it, you know, it, it, it's like, you know, you draw the card monopoly, go back three spaces. Okay. Go back three spaces, start again. Yep. It, you know, it's, you know, the wheel doesn't stop turning, yep. you know, just, you, just because you take a step back doesn't mean the wheel stops. It keeps going. Exactly. And, and you, and you can still ascend and things. It's a little squiggly around in the middle, but yeah, right. you get there. But again, it, it, it goes back to, you know, when you're an organization or an individual and, and you're, you're people first type of mindset mm -hmm. that also works for the people themselves and how they approach their own lives and how they conduct their lives. And, and, you know, going back to, you know, what's important. And a lot of people do that. They go, okay, I got to have the house, the picket fence. Mm -hmm. Usually there's an F word after picket when I use that, but I, yeah. I'm not going to do that here. Uh, but all these, they got to have the newest this, I got to have the latest that. It's like, why? Yeah. You know, you're trying to impress somebody that quite frankly, isn't going to be impressed no matter what you do. So why are you wasting your energy on that? Have things in life that meet your needs and wants, mm -hmm. you know, your true needs and wants. I'm not telling people you can't have this or you shouldn't do that. No. I mean, if, if having the latest I Binky, which is mm -hmm. my brother's nickname for my iPhone, because I'm always on it like a little yeah. kid with a pacifier. Uh, fine, go to it. Or I'm, you know, rocking a 12, and you know, the 15 will probably be out in September. I'm not going to upgrade because not going to wood. The 12 still works. Um, and before that, I had at a least seven. for now. <laughs> at least for now, yeah, yeah. App, you know, um, the Apple listening device heard that. It's like, okay, degrade battery by yeah. another 25 percent. Uh, will he? spend the money to just upgrade the battery or will he just upgrade to a new phone? We'll find out. Um, yeah, and and okay, um, can I do permission for a 30 second tangent? Of course. So, so this, the, the, the whole, uh, the, the, the Apple listening apparatus to me, that, that is just Steve jobs, giving everyone the middle finger from be from the great beyond. It's basically saying, Oh, wait, you, you think being dead can stop me. <laughs> Come on guys. <laughs> I own you. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's it, and it's amazing. We see this all the time. Where um, if you have these listening devices yeah. in your home, uh, you might have a conversation mm -hmm. with somebody or on a phone call or uh, you know whatnot, and you're watching YouTube video, and all of a sudden you see an ad for something you were talking about, yeah. and you're you look at each other and you go, "Did we did we type that?" You know, and a search bar or anything? No, we were just having a conversation about something. Yeah, and they picked up on it, and it's like, oh, okay. And I was at a conference a few years ago, and there was a former um, product team lead mm -hmm. for one of the organizations that makes those devices. I don't want to get in trouble with anybody. And all he said was, "By no means." should you have these devices in your bedroom? And then he stopped and he wouldn't say anything else. Do not do it. And it's like, okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's, but you know, they're, they're meant, you know, for obviously for ease yeah. of use and things like that, but there's, there's two sides to a coin. So you have to, you know, figure out, okay, what is that important for me to mm -hmm. have that? Or, or can I, we existed without it before. So, you know, unless it becomes mandatory for some reason, you know, we mm -hmm. can exist without them if we don't want them. Yeah, exactly. Well, and it's, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that I've always thought would be a, uh, would be a funny tech test, you know, because of course, you know, we, we always talk about how like, you know, teenagers, kids, you know, they pick up technology so fast. And I'm like, okay, well, all right, whiz kids, what I want to do is I want to get you an old school VCR uh, with a coaxial television cable, and I want you to program it to record 60 minutes on Sunday. <laughs> because cause that's something that I did as a kid for my parents. And I want you know, I, I to see if the kids these days can handle it. 
yeah, my OCD, whenever I was at somebody's house and if that VCR was blinking 12 o'clock, I fixed that because it drove <laughs> me absolutely bonkers. You know, some people just, they, they had like tape over it. I'm like, yeah. well, what's with the tape? I don't like the blinking clock. I'm like, give me the remote, you know, <laughs> or, you know, I remember yeah. setting one where you had to do it actually on the device itself. It was, yeah. uh, I felt like I was, uh, um, diffusing a bomb, like, all right, do this, do this, don't cut the, this cable. Okay. You're good to go. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's, yeah, those things for the technology and the coax cable and even the little splitter. He had a, you know, yeah. unscrew the back of the television, the little, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. nuts that were in there, screw the screw them back in and the little toggle switch so you can play the Atari or watch it on TV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we, we, I remember those painful days and then, um, and of course, dial up internet that that would floor them. That that would absolutely yes. floor them. It's like they're in the middle of watching a thing. Then you know, mom picks up the phone, and you know, there you go, you're done. Uh, but yeah, it's it's so funny. On you know, like you said, you know, the um, the technology today, mm -hmm. people are picking it up really, really fast, uh, which is which is great. But it, it, you get to the point where it's like, okay, what what's next? And you know, we're we're yeah. getting we're glimpses of that, and it's really going to be interesting to see how we continue to automate things to make things yeah. easier. But it, uh, it, it's like, but also we we have to take a look at okay, what's the what's the personal cost in this, and the social cost and interaction and things like that. You yeah, know? exactly, exactly. Yeah like reading a map, you know, there, there's people say like, you know, a lot of people can't read a map because they're using GPSs all the yeah. time and they can't read a map. It's like, okay. Yeah. It's, it's something if no GPS is working, you know, it's like, how do we get there? Uh, map, you know, yeah. if we have one, you know, and a lot of people don't even have them. These be a staple inside of cars. Mm -hmm. I go, uh, well, yeah, well, that, yeah, and so this is, and the you know, other thing I was thinking, uh, talking about, uh, talking about technology, dial up internet and, uh, I swear I'll get to my point in a second, but uh, one of the things I was thinking was that the Google protocol, the thing that actually got Google on the map was that their uh, data load footprint was so low that the pages would actually load fast. The reason why Google has a minim minimalist interface is because it started out in the era of dial-up when people didn't have broadband. And if you wanted to try to load Yahoo or AltaVista, there were a whole bunch of images and the pages took forever to load. You know, it doesn't matter now. Everybody's got like, you know, you know, 10, 20, 100 you know, megabits, gigabits, whatever, you know, but back when it was like 28K, you need something that loaded quickly. Um, and so I think that the the uh, the thing there is that, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes people forget the problem that a company was originally created to solve. <laughs> um, and uh, actually, I don't even remember what the point was that I was coming to. So I'm just going to let you get, <laughs> I'm just going to let you take us to the, uh, uh, to the next step in the uh, next step in the conversation. Yeah, no, I just I think in wrapping up, you know, we've talked about a lot of different things and in, in trying technology and people mm -hmm. and things like that. Where do you see things over the next few years? And it could be on you know tech, it could be on on people and organizations and how they should treat people. Organizations just love to hear your mm -hmm. overall thoughts on that because I know you've got a ton of them. On, yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, and so I think the the. Thinking forward to the next few years, right? You know, a lot of people are really worried about AI. And gen generally speaking, I mean, I think some people will be impacted by AI. Uh, but what it'll, what will happen is there's some people who have fairly, I don't want to say simple, but you know, who have, who have jobs that are pretty rote, right? That can be programmed away. Those will be programmed away and, and replaced by AI or other stuff like that. What will happen is the people who have uh, jobs or careers or whatever that involve things AI can't do will be made tremendously more productive by AI. Um, and so I think the, 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 the march of the economy is that you have an increasingly smaller and smaller number of people within the existing economic structure that get made more and more and more productive. And so then what happens is for the people who end up being displaced by that, then usually they'll end up starting something either starting something kind of new technology based that can scale this is where this is where things like the you know apple zoom uh airbnb this is where those types of new businesses come from or they'll go in artisan direction they'll start like a bakery or a comic book shop or some or a coffee shop or something like that and both of those are perfectly fine um and i think the thing is that right there's this there's this mindset that like you know everybody needs to have a corporate job in order to be okay and that's not the case 
Uh, there are a lot of people who would be much, much happier if they just had a pizza parlor and they got, you know, and they, they engaged with their community and, you know, okay. Yeah. May, you know, maybe they didn't retire with 10 million bucks in their 401k, but all right. Well, you actually don't need that much really. <laughs> not if you, you know, not, you know, not, not, not if you have modest desires. And in a lot of cases, I think people can get way happier just by modulating down what they're, what they want to consume and just connecting more with other people. Yeah. It's the connecting with people. That was a lesson that uh, was really loud during the early days mm, of the pandemic yeah. when we weren't able to gather right. together. And I think it uh, is a reminder for all us all that we, you know, we, there's, there's something to be said about, yeah. you know, community and, and yeah, you don't have to be that, you know, corporate, you know, 80 hour week thing. You, there's a lot of people that are happy. It's like, you know, I'm going to work a part-time job working at Target in my community or yeah. whatever store or bakery or, you know, open up a pizza shop because, you know, people like eating pizza. So exactly. you're, you're going to have a steady customer as long as your pizza tastes okay. It, it tastes yeah. great. You're great. You'll be so swamped. You won't know what to do with it. But right. as long as it's decent and priced uh, at a point where people can consume it, you'll, you'll be good. So yeah. good stuff, man. So Doug, I've loved this conversation. Where can people find out more about you and all this amazing work you're doing? Uh, thank you for the, uh, thank you for the tea up. So my website is peoplefirstleaders.net. That's P O P L E F I R S T L E A D E R S dot N E T. Uh, that's where you can, you know, you'd be able to find my show if that's where you can submit yourself as a guest. So just do backslash guest or forward slash guest, uh, and then just put in your information and then my team will get back to you. Uh, but of course, you know, shows on iTunes, Spotify, all the networks. And so please, yeah, uh, check it out, subscribe. And, uh, by all means, let me know if there is something that you like about the show or that I can do better. I love feedback because it gives me a chance to create a better product. You know, and feedback gives us growth opportunities as well. So, uh, love to have another conversation with you, Doug. Be well. Uh, you too. Thanks for listening to The Breakfast Leadership Show, part of the Breakfast Leadership Network. Visit breakfastleadership.com for tips on empowering your business and your life.